thank you. Um, so, yes, um, I would like first to uh, thank the organizers, in particular uh, Dr. Klimpel, for uh, having Google on stage. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, for long, I've been a professor of law. I've depressed generations of students uh, teaching copyright law. Uh, I joined Google this summer, uh, and I work on the copyright team. Uh, you know Google, you know, we make cars, we make balloons, uh, that's mostly what we do. Uh, not only this, we also give access to information, it's our main mission. Um, well, as you, you, you I'm, f I'm sorry that I will have to speak English, not German. Uh, and if you don't want to suffer from my French accent, I think it might be also interesting to begin this conference in French. Sous, <laughs> sous le pont Mirabeau coule la Seine et nos amours. Faut-il qu'ils m'en souviennent La joie venait toujours après la peine. Vienne la nuit, seul honneur. Les jours s'en vont et je demeure. This is a, an excerpt from a, a poem by one of the most famous French poets. This is, you may have recognized him, uh, either from uh, the quotation or from the picture that's here. His name is Apollinaire. And Apollinaire is uh, someone who, yeah, again, one of the most famous French poets, and he died in the end of the First World War. He died in 1918, and I guess that most of you have enough knowledge of copyright law to know that his works entered the public domain when? When that? It's your turn to work. I don't look at the lawyers here because you know everything. But when do pub I mean, copyrighted works enter the public domain? Nobody knows this? Yes, yeah, speak loud. Excellent answer. So, so the 1st of January, after 70 years after the death. So, I mean, if you do your math well, this guy, I mean, the works of Apollinaire should have been in the public domain in 1989. Interestingly, it's not what happened. It's not what happened. Uh, even though in European copyright law, I mean, his work should have been in public domain in 1989, it's not what, ha what happened here for a specific station that I want to start with. And, and interestingly also, uh, his works are parts of the public domain in other countries since 1969, for example, in Canada. So it's really strange because you have a different calculation of what enters the public domain, what is free to use, I mean, a different calculation depending on the countries. Well, here it's not 79. Why that? Because Apollinaire is uh, someone who, who I said, died at the end of the First World War. And he died because partly he was wounded, he was hit by a bullet during the war. And because he was hit by a bullet, he was uh, weak, and because he was weak, he died from the Spanish flu two days after having hit. He was hit in 1960. So because of this special status, because of this special situation, uh, he can have a, an extension, I mean, his works have an extension of duration of copyright. So uh, because of this particular death, his works came to the public domain, not in 1989, not even after, they came after a long period. Why that? Again, because there's this exception for the calculation of when works come to the public domain. And it's interesting because it means that it's not on the 1st of January that the work came to the public domain. It's after that. It's two months ago. So that's the reason I've been able to use freely the works of Apollinaire to open this. Three months ago, it would have probably been a copyright violation to do so. And it's interesting because one of the reasons why we created this uh, uh, law under which uh, there's a 70 years protection after the death of the author is to protect the children, the children which, who can also enjoy the revenues from the work. But interestingly here, uh, Apollinaire was dead without any child. So it's really strange because you have a really different, as, I mean, you have a, a gap between what was the law was intended for and uh, the uh, situation we have here. So this is what I want to speak about today. 
the, uh, how complex it is to deal with uh, public domain issues, in other words, to deal with what we can do with works of the past, with works which belong to the cultural heritage. And public domain is extremely complex, extremely complex. I guess some of the people in the audience here are behind this uh, tool, which is uh, fascinating. It's the public domain calculator. If you want to know when a journal work will come to the public domain, it's easy. Look, look at the pictures here. It's so easy. You know, it's extremely simple to calculate. So depending on the work, depending on where it's been published first, depending on different things, it will come to the public domain at different periods. This is what we have to deal with every day. And this is, again, extremely complex to deal with. So this is the first uh, remark we can make. When we work on questions of public domain, uh, we work on something which is extremely complex to deal with. First, calculation is complex. When does a work come to the public domain? When is it possible to use it without any fear of copyright violation? Well, it's supposed to be 70 years after the death of the author, but it's not exactly this. You know, it may be different, and it's different also depending on the country where you're in. So Apollinaire went to the public domain in France in two th 2013, but it's 1969 in Canada. What does it mean if I'm online, if I'm in France, and I want to browse a website, a Canadian website, where the works are? Am I infringing French law, etc.? I mean, it's extremely complex. We lawyers are happy with this, okay? Because the more, I mean, when the law is complex, it creates jobs for lawyers, okay? So, and we can bill our words, etc. That's good. But again, this is not about, it's not only about law, it's also about access to culture. It's also the question of how do we deal with all these rules that govern our access to the cultural heritage. So public domain is complex. And at the same time, it's shrinking. Shrinking why? I guess some of you, many of you, know the story. But um, for years, I mean, so the current calculation is 70 years after the death of the author. But f before that, it's been a shorter period. And during the 90s in the US, uh, the work came to the public domain after 50 years. And in the 90s, one of the most famous creations of the 20th century, Mickey Mouse, was about to enter the public domain. And this was a tragedy for who? For the owner of the rights for uh, the Walt Disney Company. And it's documented, I'm not making this up here, it's documented that one of the reasons why US changed its laws and extended the duration from 50 years to 70 years is partly due to the fact that uh, there were voices to say that authors should be better protected and this is also something that came from some lobbying probably from, um, from Disney. And it's interesting because this happened during the 90s uh, and what we can expect is, I mean, wh what we can ask is what will happen when Mickey Mouse is again about to enter the public domain? Will there be another extension? Well, recently I've read in the press that apparently uh, lobbyists are prepared to uh, make the case for another extension. Just read that in a Washington Post, but uh, and again, it shows that another Contemporary phenomenon is that the public domain is shrinking. And we have here a view of this. I mean, the closer we go to our period, the less access we have to cultural heritage. It's going farther and farther and farther. Okay, so that is another thing. Public domain is complex. I mean, complex to calculate the duration, complex because of the legal fragmentation, and complex, and also it's far, it's shrinking because of these different phenomena. What is the public domain? I mean, it's not only public domain, it's what we can do with works. And if we try to define, if we try to draw the public domain, it's not a neat, it's not a plain uh, territory. It's something with bumps, with hills, with holes, etc. Hence the reason I chose this map. Uh, public domain is what you can do with works after 
the, uh, the rights are extinguished, but also what you can do with works when there are exceptions, when the author or the owner of the rights cannot prevent you from using the work. For example, you can quote someone, you can parody your work. This is what we call exceptions. It is, these are situations in which you can freely, I mean, freely in the sense of freedom, uh, use uh, the works without fearing any lawsuit, etc. So the public domain is twofold. You have the extension, I mean, uh, the, the public domain is first uh, all works that are old enough to uh, be part of from it, from it, and also the situation where you can use existing in copyright works because there are exceptions for this. This is the uh, European system. And exceptions are hard to characterize, to, to know exactly what they're uh, made of. And it means that when you want to explain to people or when you want to work on I mean, uh, what you can do with existing works, it's really hard to draw, it's really hard to figure, to represent what the do public domain is. Let me cite another French author. This time it's Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And you know in the famous novel, The Little Prince, the little prince wants someone to draw a ship a sheep. I say, please, please draw me a sheep. And the guy doesn't know how to do this, so he draws a box and with holes for the sheep to be able to breathe. So if you wanted to uh, draw the public domain, it would be the same thing. How can we draw it? How can we represent it? It's extremely hard. In other words, the law is not designed to allow us uh, to access or to freely use works. It's, it's designed in a different way. And that is a tragedy for us because it's uh, complex to deal with existing stuff because also uh, it shows, and we've seen this with examples before, that we don't know what we can do with existing works that we would like to archive. And this has been the subject of previous discussions. We at Google, we also have had issues with this. When people ask uh, content to be removed from YouTube, Sometimes we don't know if the work is in the public domain or not. Sometimes we don't know if the law of this or that country applies to, uh, I mean, if the parody, for example, can uh, be uh, used as a defense for the person who uploaded the video, et cetera, et cetera. It's extremely hard to do this. We undertook uh, years ago to scan books, and I will go back to this afterwards. Again, we don't know exactly what we can do with books. We don't know if the author is dead or not, etc. It's extremely hard. And for all practical activities dealing with information, we all, and when I say we, it's not only Google, it's uh, all people engaged into the preservation of cultural heritage, it's extremely hard to deal with all the subtleties of copyright law. And at the same time, it's extremely important. I mean, the public domain is really what we can do with existing works. And what can we do? Again, it's what's part of the public domain, extinction of rights and plus exceptions. And if you look at the existing law, I said it's designed not to protect the public domain, there's something really clear here. Uh, if you read the EU directive, the copyright directive on, uh, that dates back to uh, 2001, uh, and if you count the number of times the expression public domain is cited, well, do you know this? Thomas, you know this? Zero, yes, you're right, excellent, here we are. Uh, so it means that there's really a focus on what authors, right owners can prevent, but absolutely nothing about how to protect the public domain and how to encourage its preservation, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's, it, that's complex. So it means that, uh, again, the concern of legislators is not about, you know, all these activities uh, surrounding the use of, ex of works, I mean, free uses through exceptions or uh, uses of works on the public domain. And it's interesting to see this. It's interesting to see that in our age of information, there's not a word on public domain. Maybe it's because of the guilt, or maybe because it's so, it's so obvious that works normally belong to the public domain, except when they're under, under copyright, that there's no need to mention. I don't know exactly the reason, but it's interesting to uh, go here. At the same time, what we see is that no one, because there's no consecration by itself of the public domain, no one is entitled to speak for it. No one is entitled to speak for the public domain or to try to defend it. Let me take another example. It's a French one again, 
that will go to German decisions afterwards. Um, this is a story of a man who really loves David Lynch. So he loves David Lynch, and be because of this, he buys a copy of the DVD which, uh, w where you, you can see the movie Mulham Drive. And this person has a secondary home. He has another uh, house close to the sea, and he would like to make a copy of the DVD he purchased to take to his second home. But the problem is that the DVD is, uh, has uh, technologi technological measures against copy. So he cannot make a copy. But he believed he could, because one of the exceptions that exists in copyright law is the right to copy, not the right, is the possibility to copy without um, the possibility for the author to prevent this. So he cannot copy because there's this te technological measure. So what does he do? I mean, he wants to obey to the law. He's not trying to download uh, another copy from the web, etc. He goes to the court and he says to the court exactly what I said. I have a second home. I would like to have a copy of the DVD I legally purchased. Would you uh, allow me to do so? And it was a long case that went up to the Supreme Court in France. And in the end, this person was barred from uh, having the possibility to copy. Why that? Because the court ruled well. You can copy, sure, but that is an exception to copyright. And if it's an exception, it's not a right. And if it's not a right, you cannot go to courts because courts can only protect existing rights and cannot protect you against exception to this. And again, that is a tragedy because it shows that even though there are exceptions to copyright, there are possibilities to do so, these possibilities are not necessarily protected by existing copyright law. Another example is, and this one is much more tricky, it's an example, and again, it's a French one, an example on moral rights. This is a French singer, called, his name is Jean Ferrat, and uh, his, uh, the recordings of the first songs he made came to the public domain a few years ago. So this time, it's not 70 years after his death, it's 50 years after the date of the recording, it's another rule that applies, but whatever. And so a publisher decided to take these recordings, which were in the public domain, uh, press a CD with uh, the best songs of his early career and uh, sold the CD for a really, really low price. And this CD was for sale in a supermarket. And interestingly, Jean Ferrat said, well, having my face and my name on this really poor quality CD is against my right to paternity, is against my moral right. I feel, um, I feel like uh, my personality is violated because of this. I feel that moral rights are violated, for those who are familiar with the notion of moral rights. And the court agreed. The court agreed that uh, selling this kind of CD was violating the perpetual right that one has to protect it, uh, its identity. And so because of this, we see that another copyright rule may, from time to time, threaten the entrance of a work in the public domain. And again, it shows that we have different strategies here. Another example, and this is a study that came out this summer, is a study that, that was made by um, an American scholar, uh, an economist, who wanted to count the respective numbers of books available, whether they belong to the public domain or to, uh, they're still in copyright. And it gave this. There are more books available which are in the public domain than books which are still in copyright. Well, you could say it's normal because it's cheaper to produce these books. Yes, but there's more competition to publish books which are in the public domain, when usually you just have one publisher who has the right on a book, and because this publisher is alone, it should be easy for me. There should be more books in, uh, that should be in the graph after the 30s. That's interesting because here we really see that a sort of cultural black hole. I mean, we see that copyright law, which is there to encourage creation and which should be also a way to assure, ensure access and availability of books, it doesn't work like this. There are more books which are, which are available, which belong to the public domain, than more recent books. And it's a tragedy again because it shows that 
copyright, and it's not my, my, me saying this, works tend to disappear from the public view because of copyright, when it should be the opposite. Because again, if you're the rights owner, you have the monopoly and you shouldn't be afraid of competition when you publish books. So again, it's really strange to see this, and it's even more strange when you think that the number of books that have been published in the 30s has exploded. And if it has exploded, there should be even more um, uh, things on the graph here. But again, we, showed, we see here that in the period of 70 years before us, I mean, books tend to disappear. Extremely strange situation. So what do we see? I mean, it's just a rapid uh, tour of what's existing, public domain, exceptions, uh, how copyright laws sometimes stifle uh, the uh, access to distribution, etc. What we see is that there are different barriers in the law when it comes to the access to culture. The public domain is shrinking, is complex, etc. Plus, there's a sort of cultural black hole. Again, it's hard to access, access works which are still in copyright and access works which were, which still are in the public domain. And that even worse when you think that if you look at the directive, the one that uh, guarantees us exceptions, this directive, the 2001 directive on copyright, which I mentioned earlier, there are 21 exceptions only, and all the exceptions that relate to culture are not mandatory. States do not have to implement the exceptions that guarantee us access to culture. And again, if you look at this, no mention of public domain, no uh, guarantee that a state can enact these exceptions, etc. It shows again that the law is not in fit to encourage access to culture. So, if we are facing this situation, should we cry? Should we... Uh, flee, should we leave the room, say, well, there's nothing that can be done, but maybe there are things that could be done. For example, uh, we believe that there could be a little more flexibility in existing European copyright law, and it could be a way to remedy uh, the problems that were uh, quickly identified, problem of access to culture, and a way to disseminate more knowledge. Again, if there's more flexibility if the rules are not as complex as we saw before. Remember the public domain calculator. Maybe it will allow more access, more dissemination of culture and knowledge, etc. And these changes we believe are needed. And when I say we, it's not only us at Google. It's again, when you study the existing legal framework, I mean, you don't understand anything. Even when you're a lawyer, it's so complex. So if we want to encourage, and it's been one of the subjects of the discussion today, if you want to encourage more dis digitization, you also need to have a more flexible, a, more, a softer environment. If we want to enable more preservation of cultural heritage, also need to uh, work on this legal environment. There's no way this can be done otherwise. Changes are needed. And they are needed with a different state of mind, uh, I mean, different approach to things. We have also to change the paradigm. We have to change the way we look at culture today and the way people access culture. Why do I say this? Because recently I bumped into something, um, one of the most fascinating things I've read probably in the last weeks. It's the regulations uh, that apply in UK, in, U in the United Kingdom, regarding the uh, libraries in Great Britain which are in charge of legal deposit. You know what it is, right? Uh, every time a publisher publishes a new book or a journal, a copy of the book or journal must be given for free to the library in charge of legal deposit. And interestingly, here, uh, there's a rule, a really strange rule, which says that every time a journal is given in paper version, in paper version or uh, sorry, in uh, electronic version, or a book in electronic version to the library, the library should behave as if it were a paper version. Okay, so I just published an ebook. I have the legal duty to give it to the British Library, but the British Library, which has a copy of this ebook, must only uh, give access to this book one person at a time, when it could be accessed by many people at the same time. It is really strange. I saw once a cartoon where uh, the librarians answered to a 
to a client, oh, we have this book, but we know we just scanned the whole library and we put it on a CD-ROM and we just lent the CD-ROM, so we cannot lend the book to you. It's the same story here. I mean, how can we reproduce for electronic files rules that existed for paper? It makes no sense to me. There might be sense somewhere, but again here, this is an example of a regulation that was taken this year regarding the preservation of digital, I mean, of cultural heritage, and which applies a way to look at things which is probably outdated. So we need changes, and we also need to change the way people look at things. And I'm speaking mainly of cultural heritage, but it's not only about this. I mean, culture, it's not only books of the past, it's not only um, uh, paintings, journals of the past, etc. It's also what we do every day with our smartphones, with our um, cameras, etc. Cultural is also about cats, it's about dogs, it's about people we like. We make photos, we create. Uh, some of these creations can be copyrighted, many of them probably. This is the German case you were expecting, and I would like to thank my colleague Georg, uh, who uh, gave me this picture. Unfortunately, I cannot cite the author because we don't know who the author is. This is a case that went before German court. When it was, it was ruled that this photo, two sausages, is under copyright. This photo is under copyright, which means that if this photo, one of the most basic and simple photos that we can make, I mean, the photos of two sausages is under copyright, most of what we do is under copyright. Photos of sausages, photos of cats, I want to reassure you, I mean, these sausages are not, were not made with the cat, okay? It's, uh, I'm not sure the names, but I mean, we are sharing. What we do is we share photos, we take photos every day, and uh, we exchange every day, and sorry, uh, nearly one billion photos a day. Nearly one billion photos a day. So 70, 50 million, 750 million for the moment, but it may increase, and it means that, again, if we exchange photos of cats, of cars, of cocktails, of sausages, etc., every day, and every time copyright law may apply to this, what does it mean? Does it mean that we have to ask for the permission every time, that we have, that we have to change the way the current sharing culture exists? It's really an issue here. And that's another challenge for the existing framework in copyright law. How do we make copyright fit for 99% of the works that are being created today? There was a time when copyright was designed for a few authors of books, a few painters, a few sculptures. It was essentially what copyright laws had in mind. The real creators, I mean the creators of fine arts. Now copyright law applies to our daily activities. The mere, of, I mean, the, only, the every photo we can take might be subject to copyright. Again, how do we switch from this 1% to this 99%? How do we make copyright law fit for 99% of the works that are being created today? Do we need to ask the permission every time we share on Facebook? Suppose the yes. And it's not the way it's supposed to be, to be. I mean, or it's not the way we see culture. So we really see a shift, a difference in how we approach culture and exchange and uh, the way we share things. So there's a difference in balance. I mean, really, the, the balance in copyright has changed dramatically because of the way we want to access culture. We want to read things on screen. We want to view things on screen. We want to exchange photos. We want to make photos, videos, etc., etc. So there's a big difference between the practices of the day and the existing laws. And so the balance in copyright, which is supposed to be a fair balance between the interests of the author and the interests of the public, the people who share, has changed dramatically. So if it's changed, what does it mean? It means that also it's necessary to work on the legal framework to be able to change this. Look at this website. Many of you know here, it here. It's an initiative by librarians in US to archive the web. This initiative was started in the 90s. At the time they started this in the US, it was okay to do this. But if they wanted to have start to, to launch this project in Europe at the same time, the same initiative probably would have been illegal. Why that? Because they decided to copy the web to preserve a picture of the pages that existed. This is legal in the US, 
it's legal, it was probably illegal in Europe at that time. Why? Because you cannot copy uh, if you don't uh, do it for your own purposes. If you copy to make uh, your, the copies public, you're violating copyright. So how come we have an initiative which is lawful in US can be unlawful in Europe? This is striking to me because it shows that there's a difference again between the two sides of the Atlantic regarding the preservation of cultural heritage and the web is fully part of it. And here uh, we have an interesting decision that may highlight the differences and uh, the uh, case for flexibility that I want to make here. And this uh, ruling that uh, uh, is worth mentioning here illustrates the differences between a flexible system, which is the system of fair use, and a more rigid system, which is the one I described and criticized since I began this speech, European copyright laws. You may have heard, and Paul mentioned it before I started, you may have heard the, 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 the decision that was issued in New York uh, two weeks ago in, uh, over Google Books. You know, it has been discussed today, that Google undertook to uh, copy, uh, to scan books with, in partnership with libraries uh, to make them available online. And when this big project was undertaken, there were voices to say, well, is this legal or not? And this question has been debated before um, uh, US courts. And two weeks ago, uh, the New York court ruled that it was okay for Google to do this. And why that? Because of all the advantages, because of all the benefits this has for access to culture. First, the court said, well, when uh, a company like ours uh, scans books and puts them, puts them online, it gives a new possibility for people to access these books. Researchers can access a wider range of books. People living in, com in uh, villages far from a library, instead of driving to the library, etc., can use their internet connection to access books. So it offers a possibility for people in remote uh, areas to be able to access it first benefit for the society. Second thing says, well, it also encourages people to read more. Uh, it gives the possibility for people to access culture in a wider way. Again, here you can, uh, you have much more books to browse. You're not limited by the choice of your library, etc. That's another benefit for society. That's what the court said. Sec third thing the court ruled, uh, not only uh, it's okay to, uh, give access to these books, but at the same time, uh, when you scan them and we store them in data centers all around the world, you're also giving them a new life, not only a new cultural life, but economic life too, and also you help preserve them. And when you help preserve, that's also good for the society. It's a third reason why the court said it was okay to uh, scan books. Fourth uh, reason is this one. You say, well, not only uh, it has, an ad it is an advantage for readers, for researchers, etc. But it can also create new values or new uses, for example, for researchers. Uh, the court specifically mentioned a way, I mean, something new that you can use with the corpus of books that Google Books made available, which is uh, what we call data mining. It is uh, something where you can use the collection of books that you can access through Google Books to try to identify new uh, trends in linguistics, for example. This is an example of uh, a tool that was developed uh, by researchers uh, using the uh, researchers outside Google, using the Google Books uh, corpus. Uh, it, you can compare the uh, cycle of life, I mean the, uh, the life of a word by scanning, I mean by uh, making a search into the corpus. Here, I don't know if it's visible for the audience. Uh, I did a really quick search um, where I compared the number of times the word uh, television, radio, newspaper, internet are used in books from uh, 1913 to uh, this period. And you can see here the different lines. So it's a way to try to, um, it's a way to uh, reveal information that otherwise wouldn't have been available. I've read recently that uh, people writing 
uh, the dialogues of a, of a TV show which is supposed to take place in the 70s always check on our corpus whether or not the dialogues that they write were supposed or could have been pronounced in the 70s using Google Books. So that's interesting again because it shows that when you aggregate content, you also offer new values to the public. So that's the fourth reason why the court said okay to this. And in the end, uh, the court also said that, well, not only uh, this project uh, is a way for uh, readers, researchers, etc., to access more books, but at the same time, it's because Google Books offers a link to a place where you can buy the book, it also, it's also good for authors and publishers because they can still make money from uh, the use of books that are still in copyright. So these are the, f the reasons why the court decided that uh, it was okay to do this. And interestingly, it illustrates my point of the day. We believe that for the preservation of heritage, for the access to culture, there should be more flexibility in copyright law. And flexibility is something that exists in all the systems of law, such as fair use in US, in Israel, and in other countries where this notion was, was invented to try to adjust to the pace at which new technologies um, allow us to create new things. In the ruling, uh, the court said, well, thanks to this project, all society benefits, all of us, readers, researchers, library users, um, uh, companies, etc. And it's where I wanted to, to end the speech here. It's not a question of expanding or I mean the US values or fair use, I mean to implement fair use um, aggressively in Europe. It's really the question of what do we want? Do we want rigid, rigid rules in copyright law which prevent us as citizens to access culture? Do we want rigid rules which prevent uh, libraries, museums, and others to create new collections, to create access to culture online where people are spending their lives today. We're spending a lot of time online, so if you want culture to be there, we also have to work on this. So really, it's uh, what we believe uh, at Google, it's what I wanted to say. Uh, we uh, or believe is more flexibility in copyright, and uh, I will be happy to discuss this afterward. Thank you.